Hello, I am Dagny Zhu, Medical Director at Envision Eye Centers at Roland Heights, California. And today I'm joined by Dr. William Wiley, Assistant Professor at CWR University Hospitals and Medical Director at the Cleveland Eye Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. In this episode, we will discuss the diagnostic and surgical techniques that can be used to correct astigmatism before, during, and after cataract removal. So thanks for joining us, Bill. How are you? Doing well, Dagny. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No, we're honored to have you with us today to talk about a very important uh, topic. So as you know, uh, it's super important to correct a patient's astigmatism to get them their best visual outcome. And we've come a long way in terms of the technologies that we have now. Um, back in the day, before even before my time, I would say, <laughs> limbo relaxing incisions were pretty popular, but I know that there's still a place for it today. Um, but we've since progressed with uh, some astigmatism correction abilities with a femtosecond laser, and of course with torque correcting IOLs and even some more advanced IOLs now. So let's talk a little bit about some of the methods that we can use today for correcting astigmatism during cataract surgery. And what kind of methods do you like to use, Bill? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think astigmatism is sort of the easy button for a premium uh, surgery. I think everybody should at least be offering astigmatism correction as a, a base entry and. Uh, you know, you know, in addition, obviously, to presbyopia correction, obviously, I think that's important. But uh, if you want to just go with monofocal astigmatism correction, I think you can really make a difference to your patient's outcomes. And I think uh, what's great is we've seen a lot of improvement in, in this area. Um, I think uh, what, a couple of things is what's, what's great is most of the lenses that are on the market now do have astigmatism correction. I remember when, when the, you know, presbyopic lenses first came to market, often they were only offered uh, in a monofocal without astigmatism. So we're sort of forced to use uh, some pretty aggressive uh, relaxing incisions and or uh, AKs at the time of surgery. But now more or less everything over a diopter is pretty much available to correct with some sort of torque IOL. So I think you know, leaning towards torque is, is generally preferred in my opinion, but I don't know, Dagny, what do you think? I mean, how, where do you, what's your cutoff and when you're looking at astigmatism, uh, what, what do you, how, how, how much do you push the uh, sort of arcuates or corneal-based astigmatism correction. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I try to use a toric IOL whenever possible. I think there's really no reason why you shouldn't today. And so typically if a patient has against the rule, like even 0.75 diopters astigmatism, I'll put a toric in. And usually with the rule around, you know, one, one quarter, I'll put a toric lens in and it really does a great job. There are actually a lot of lenses now that correct astigmatism. And while most of them correct around the same magnitude, uh, I find the Invista platform very helpful for like those lower levels. So sometimes I'm like debating, should I use Arcuus? Should I put in a Toric for like a plus one with the rule? Because sometimes I overcorrect with like a T3, but I really like the Invista platform because it's the only one that corrects astigmatism under one diopter um, at the corneal plane. So that's a helpful one for me. Yeah, totally agree. I think um, the Invista platform, especially that 125, their lowest po power, in theory, should be the most common lens used. If you look at the bell-shaped curve and where are the bulk of our patients, most of them are sitting in that low threshold. So having the ability to treat down as low as a little bit under diopter, I think is great. And sort of that, uh, you know, you know, with the rule, so be, like you said, you don't want to overcorrect with the rule. And so uh, a lot of times that 125 is the perfect lens. And uh, you know, I think it's a it's a great opportunity to to make a difference in their in your patient's outcome. Yeah, and I think a lot of the other torque lenses on the market, like the Clarion, the Technus, I mean, they're all really great at correcting astigmatism and the rotational stability of the torque IL has been great. Like to be honest, I haven't had too many like post-op surprises where the lens, you know, rotates and it's not where I put it. So I've been pretty happy with the modern designs of the torque ILs. Totally agree. I think early on we we were, you know, sort of big fans. Yeah, you know, I'm dating myself, but when when let's say the star torque lens was the only one available to correct astigmatism of plate haptic, you know, we'd use that a lot. But it was really prone to uh, rotation. I think upwards of twenty percent of those uh, lenses rotated to some degree. Uh, yeah, so so it was hard to really have confidence in the outcomes with that lens. But uh, and and some of the earlier sort of uh, you know uh, more traditional style lenses. Did well, but they also had rotational issues, at least some platforms. But I think most recently in the past year or two, almost every platform out there is going to have rotation rates less than, let's say, 1% or 2%, which can give you confidence to, to deliver the outcome you're looking for. 
Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, that being said, I think there's still a place for correcting lower levels of stigmatism, like less than one or 0.75 even. Like you mentioned, like both of us, I think we do a lot of premium IOL implants. And there's a lot of data showing how even a tiny amount of stigmatism can really you know, negatively affect the vision of a premium IOL patient, or even a model focal sometimes. I think uh, Dr. Wartz and Gupta, they published a really great paper looking at uh, astigmatism correction of low levels in monofocal IOL. So they were correcting an average of 0.6 or 0.65, like really low levels of astigmatism with femto AKs. And they actually found a significant difference in like the uncorrected distance vision between the lenses, uh, between the eyes that they corrected and the eyes that they did not correct. Totally agree. You know, I think that's a, a really important concept to consider. A lot of people will say, well, you know what? The patients won't really notice if they have a half diopter of astigmatism or less. And so why, why go after that or why correct it? But the reality is to achieve a half diopter, you have to be really uh, aggressive. Just because you're starting with a half doesn't mean that's where they're going to end up. And so you want to treat almost any amount of astigmatism, even 0.3 or something like that, because you don't know how healing is going to affect and that half diopter could turn to 0.75 afterwards. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of like to get an average of zero, you really have to be aggressive and try to, you know, aim as low as you can. And so, um, I, you know, if they end up at a half, I think the patients are going to be happy, but you really should try to aim for zero. And so then if you have this little bit of a miss, you're still within that range. So. Uh, I'm a fan of being aggressive and treating astigmatism. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. And also even the incision itself, the wound that you're creating can often push that patient into like with the rule of astigmatism that's above the threshold level where they start getting, you know, visual quality issues. So all important things to take into account. So as we're getting more and more precise with our astigmatism correction, I think um, even in the IOL space, it's gotten even more precise with the stigmatism and correction where we talk about the light adjustable lens. Like that's as precise as you can get today, right? So you can, you can even with all the variable healing, you know, with your surgically induced astigmatism, no matter what ends up in that eye, you can fix it with a light adjustable lens to a great amount of precision, more so than we could ever uh, do before. Are you a big fan of the light adjustable lens? Yeah, for, for a group of patients, I think it's a great choice. Uh, particularly post-refractive eyes or eyes that you know, you're not really confident in the biometry um, for one reason or the other. I think it's a great choice uh, for that high demand patient, the patient that's really particular, that really wants to get as close to plain as possible. I think it's hard to beat the light adjustable lens. And the fact that you can treat a uh, program a uh, half diopter uh, into that lens, I think uh, is it, you know, technically the lowest power you can uh, treat. It, it, granted, it's not a torque lens, but the fact that you can adjust that half diopter uh, you know, allows you to tr really get that uh, you know, small amount uh, in the post-operative period. So what's the maximum amount of stigmatism that the LAL uh, can adjust for? Well, I feel confident treating up to three diopters. Um, it depends. You know, each patient is different, but you can treat, you can feel pretty confident treating you know, about three diopters uh, with the lead adjustable. There you go. That's amazing. So yeah, we have a lot of options today for astigmatism correction. So before we even get to the correction of astigmatism, I think it's really important to do that preoperative workup, right? To figure out how much astigmatism a patient truly has. So I will how power combination is essential for achieving good outcomes in our patients. So we have some uh, updates now in the biometers that we can use to um, more precisely measure astigmatism, both anterior and posterior. And it can be very helpful for calculating eye will power in like the challenging patients that you were talking about, post myopic uh, laser vision correction or, you know, keratoconus patients. Um, so what what are, what are can you tell us about some of these biometers and do you, do you use some of these biometers for uh, astigmatism correction or more precise astigmatism correction? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to see the sort of advancements in that biometer space. And what's interesting, there's an op, you know, options there. For example, you have the IOL Master, which has the new total uh, uh, TK or total cornea uh, that allows you to see anterior and posterior cornea to get a better idea of what that corneal stigmatism is. Uh, you've got the Pentacam that uh, also does the same uh, type of measurements uh, for their biometry. And what's nice is when you use that Pentacam, you, you get the um, you know, tomography that gives you an idea of what's going on with the cornea, is there pathology there or not, in addition to the biometry, and it can help with 
workflow, you know, you can do just one test and capture two very important aspects uh, of the test. You have the Aladdin biometer, which is more of a traditional topography connected to uh, abarometry or biometry, which is great. And so you can see that topography coupled with the biometer. Um, other things, let's say like the Argos uh, or Callisto are two diagnostics that can capture that astigmatism and give you information that, that can then help with guidance during the surgery. So I think that's one of the big step forwards is getting this digital guidance at the time of surgery to translate what you're measuring, you know, preoperatively to then see it intraoperatively. So it's uh, it's cool to see that almost all the major companies are offering or either now or soon to offer digital guidance. So you have, let's say, Callisto uh, for digital gui guidance from the Iowa Master, Argos that's going to guide um, the Varian with with the uh, intraoperative abarometry coupled with Aura. You've got um, Cassini that's also has something similar to uh, they're developing this their own technology that hooks to scopes to any scope that gives you that digital caliper during surgery. I'm thinking well, I may be missing a few by the Topcon device, which is uh, very cool. So you've got all these companies that are basically seeing the importance of gathering that preoperative diagnostic. And then showing that at the time of surgery to assure that you've put that lens or arcuate incision or whatever it might be in that exact spot. It's pretty awesome how the biometers are like taking it to the next level. They're not just getting you the pre-op diagnostics, but they're like giving you a visualization system so that you can use intra-op to really guide the placement of the toric IOL, right? So it's coming together all as a package. So we talked a little bit about posterior corneal and how some of the biometers measure the total corneal power. Like how often do you actually use the posterior cornea values, like the total corneal power, do you use it for all your standard cases or specific cases only? Right now, we're using it standard. Yeah, so it's just part of what we're measuring for all cases, and that's going into our consideration. And so that helps give us an idea of what the lens might be. And then we're double checking that with intraoperative aberometry, which, you know, in a way is measuring the total cornea power through uh, uh, intraoperative refractions that measures that refractive effect. Uh, through abarometry. So you have sort of two different checks, a, a preoperative check, but also interoperative check to kind of help, you know, give you two data points that then you can make a decision on. That is awesome that you use that for every case. Like the precision is like insane. And I think a lot of our listeners might not have access to like the posterior cur cur curvature data. So just so you know, so you feel a little better. Um, there, there was a study looking at, you know, comparing, measuring the actual total corneal power with the posterior corneal uh, component versus just using Barrett True K to predict the posterior corneal curvature. And they were actually pretty similar. I think TK came out a little bit on top, but you can still get pretty good outcomes with some of the newer formulas that we have today, which is still reassuring. But um, definitely in complex eyes, like post LBC eyes, keratoconus eyes, there's a lot of data showing that putting in the total corneal values, the true power makes a huge difference. So I definitely recommend you measure those values whenever possible for those eyes. Um, what's your go-to IOL formula for uh, astigmatism or just IOL power calculation in general when you plug in like the true value, the TK value? We're using the Barrett for our go-to. And I think um, you know the uh, Barrett for astigmatism is, is amazing. So it does take into account that predictive value uh, based on nomograms, what it, it believes the um, astigmatism is going to be for that uh, posterior corneal piece. And uh, I think it is important, you know, you know, Doug Koch's work in that area to sort of identify the posterior cornea uh, contribution to astigmatism was, was critical. And so I think regardless, like you said, if you can't measure it, just having that understanding that there's nomograms that can help predict it is really important. What's interesting, there's actually a number of other modern day formulas too that also take in true like corneal, total corneal values with the posterior curvature. So there's also the EVO, post-LVC, the Hopper QST, um, and the Pearl DGS. So those can also be used for like post-LVC patients where you can actually plug in the, the measured posterior corneal curvature, which is actually, I, I never knew that there were that many formulas that exist today. So just some food for thought if you were tired of Barrett 2K, but that is the one I use as well. <laughs> it is the most popular one. Totally. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on... Um... The future with uh, AI and artificial intelligence and how mass data might guide our, our thoughts. I feel like there's so much untapped, untapped knowledge that's out there and seeing how some of the systems are having this sort of 
guidance or data management systems to kind of capture that data and then hopefully, you know, collaborate and, 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 you know, you know, gather it to kind of guide uh, surgeons in a, you know, a different way than just simply the measurements alone, but uh, tapping into a deeper uh, data bank. Yep, for sure. It's only going to get better with AI. So we talked a little bit about the pre-op workup and how to get accurate measurements. We finally have our torque power with the right formula. So how can you prevent IOL misalignment. We're finally in surgery. We're going to put the lens in. This is the final step of getting the patient where they need to be. So how do you like to mark your patients or do you mark? And we talked a little bit about this earlier with digital marking systems. What's your preferred method for preventing IOL misalignment? One of the coolest devices out there uh, for that would be the femtosecond lasers that can etch the capsule based on preoperative diagnostics that measure Where's that astigmatism? Uh, takes into account uh, cyclotorsion, uh, mapping either through vessels or through the iris to kind of guide that femtosecond laser to make a little etch mark on the capsule that so that when you place the the torque lens, you'll line those marks up, and then you know uh, you know the next day or even a year later, did that lens rotate, and you can see exactly where those marks were, where the lens is supposed to be placed, and then assure that it's back in that right spot if you need to do make an adjustment. Yeah, I love my femtosecond laser for that exact feature. I think people used to do the intrastromal markings, right? You can make a tiny little AK in the cornea, but having the notch actually in the capsule at the Iowa plane makes it even easier to line up uh, in the OR, I feel like. And the fact that you can pair it with a device that does iris registration means you don't even have to mark the patient. And <clears throat> you know that the laser is going to make that notch exactly where the axis, the steep axis should be based on their iris pattern. So the precision is like second to that. I think the Callisto with the Isle Master and then Varian combined with the Argus, I think they use limbal vessel registration, which is a little bit different from iris registration. And um, that's a great method too, but I think it can get a little cumbersome if you have a little chemosis and you know the vessel anatomy changes a little bit intra-op. That's right. So yeah, I think ideally uh, iris registration would be you know the way to go. And I think um, Cassini device looks pretty cool. It looks like that you know could have a, a great place because it's looking at that iris registration. It could be you know applied to uh, almost any scope out there. And so uh, yeah, I, I had the ability to try that with our Aura device. It was cool to have both preoperative alignment, you know, guidance and interoperative and to see, you know, were those kind of correlating or did you have a different mark? And so allowed you to kind of see real time what preoperative and intraoperative was showing and you can make adjustments or lean heavier on one versus the other, depending on what was going on. Yeah, I totally agree. So this brings us to um, our last topic, which is what if you have irregular astigmatism? So TORC IOL is great for correcting regular astigmatism, but a lot of our patients have keratoconus or they have some, you know, post laser vision correction with a little bit of ectasia or just irregular astigmatism. What's your preferred method for addressing uh, cataract patients with irregular astigmatism? Traditionally, these are very challenging patients because they have that decreased best corrective visual acuity. And, um, you know, often, you know, we didn't really have a great solution for these patients possibly we'd use a light adjustable lens that could help and you know get us close but the reality is if there's a regular astigmatism it's hard to treat that with typical or traditional um, refraction you know you know glasses and contacts or intraocular lenses were challenging but now with the newest lens that's hit the market the apthera has that pinhole or aperture that can block the irregular light rays and more or less just let the clear light rays go through. And uh, that's been a great tool for these eyes that were traditionally very challenging. And, you know, for a few different reasons, for example, we've been using it a lot in uh, post RK eyes where those eyes are often having irregular astigmatism. Sometimes they're hard to predict or hit the target. Sometimes there's um, even the axis, even if it was regular astigmatism, sometimes it's hard to determine what the true axis is. Uh, so what's nice about Aptera, there is, you know, it can correct up to about a diopter and a half of astigmatism through the just the aperture optics uh, without having to worry about aligning a lens on a particular axis. Uh, it's good for RK because, you know, uh, it can help block some of the glare halo that patients were having with their RK. If they're having diurnal shifts, this aperture can be a little bit more forgiving through that diurnal shift because it can allow the patient to have that extended depth of focus to kind of get through that diurnal shift. And so uh, for a lot of different reasons, for eyes like that, I think that up there is going to be sort of the go-to solution. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's so nice having another option. Before we were sort of limited to just fixing the cornea with a laser. You know, you could do a wavefront guided or topo sorry, topography guided uh, corneal ablation before cataract surgery to sort of regularize the cornea and improve their best corrected vision. Or after surgery, you could use a meiotic drop. But I feel like the up there with the pinhole lens, it sort of addresses um, both of those issues, the halos and glare, and also the astigmatism uh, because it has such a nice large landing zone that's forgiving. So thank you so much, Dr. Wiley, for the excellent discussion. And thank you all for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and evaluation to receive CME credit and tune in for additional episodes within the podcast series. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.